So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Donald A. Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear okay? Check one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Good? Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Don Thomas, and as you heard, uh, I had the amazing opportunity to fly on four space shuttle missions. I'm one of the Ohio astronauts. You know, for years and years, Ohio had more astronauts than in any other state. Uh, I think recently, a few years ago, New York State surpassed Ohio, but we're still number two. And I think per capita, Ohio has produced more astronauts than any, any other state. John Glenn, the first Ohio one to go into space, was one of my heroes as a little boy growing up. And there's no reason why some of our young students out here today you know, shouldn't be the first person, first American, first human to set foot on the planet Mars. And we'll keep that all Ohio tradition going here. What do you think about that? All right? Good. So have you guys ever heard about a woodpecker attacking the space shuttle? It's one of the sillier stories, I think, of the, of the space shuttle program. And I'm going to tell you this story. It's called The Day a Woodpecker Attacked the Space Shuttle. Now, I come from a university. We always start with quizzes. So I just wanted to give you guys a little quiz. Does anybody know what this is here? Yeah, over here. It is? Do you know what kind? Yeah. From what vehicle? From a space shuttle. This is a space shuttle fuel tank. Pretty good. How about over here? That's a tree, right? <laughs> Let's just check. We got that right. We got that right. Okay. Let me just tell you, you guys are all a lot smarter than woodpeckers, okay? They didn't know the difference here. So let me tell you, this story takes place down at Cape Canaveral down in Florida there. That's wh where we launched the space shuttles and many of our rockets out of there. And the Cape, Cape Canaveral, is so beautiful to see from space. It juts out in central Florida from the east coast, comes out into the Atlantic. And this is a picture, and if I zoom it in a little bit more, whoops, let me go back. Over here you can see our two shuttle launch pads. Here's our vehicle assembly building. Here's our shuttle landing strip. So you can see you know, all this detail when you pass overhead in the shuttle. It was always great. Whenever we would pass over the Kennedy Space Center, all the astronauts, we would have our faces up to the window just looking out to see, hey, there's our launch pad. That, that's where we launched from a few days ago. It's really a great area there. What's also unique about the Kennedy Space Center here is it's part of the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. And this was established uh, 51 years ago. 140,000 acres. They're trying to preserve all kinds of different habitats that you see here. That we have 15 federally listed threatened or endangered species there at the Kennedy Space Center and more than 500 species of wildlife, uh, more than 1,000 species of plants. So it's a really special area that we try to preserve the wildlife there. We're also trying to launch rockets out of that same location. And that's quite a natural conflict between preserving it all and then launching these powerful rockets there. But that's what NASA's had to do ever since it was established, you know, 50 some years ago down there. And when you go down to the Kennedy Space Center, if you've ever been there, you'll see incredible wildlife, you know, from manatees. I've seen many of these just off the coast, you know, around the coast there, uh, you know, warming themselves in the sun. Bobcats, you know, snakes, bald eagles down there, alligators. I always tell people when you're watching a shuttle launch, Every now and then, look down at your toes. Make sure there's no alligator coming out at you. And wild boar. I grew up in Cleveland. I didn't see a lot of wild pigs running around up there. But you go down to the Kennedy Space Center, you drive there near sun, uh, sunrise or sunset in the evening, once things quiet down, it's really common to see you know, wild boar around the side of the road there. So there's a lot of wildlife there. Also down there, there's something called the Northern Flicker Woodpecker. They, they live in that same area. They like open habitats near trees. They generally nest in holes in trees like most woodpeckers do. Their primary food, they love insects, but they also eat ants, you know, berries and seeds. And they often drum on trees. And you know, woodpeckers do that, make that noise for a couple of reasons. One, they're, they're drilling in to make a nest, but they also just drill like that to, to claim their territory. If you hear all this rattling going on, if you're another woodpecker, you're going to stay away from that area because somebody else is claiming it. And they, are, as well, are a protected species at the Kennedy Space Center. And what that means is they cannot be harmed. And that's the same true with all the wildlife down there. You can't harm any of the wild, wildlife. It's got to be protected there. So this is a story that takes place about my second space shuttle mission. 
This was the STS-70 flight aboard Space Shuttle Discovery. And we got assigned as a crew uh, in late 1994. Our mission, we were going to fly in June of 1995. And they assigned five astronauts to this crew. And this is our commander, who's Tom Henricks. He was an Air Force pilot. Kevin Kriegel was our pilot on the mission. He was also an Air Force test pilot. We had Nancy Curry, who was an Army helicopter pilot. Mary Ellen Weber, uh, who was a chemical engineer. And myself, I'm a materials engineer. And they signed the five of us to this mission, and we looked at each other after we got assigned, and we noticed something kind of unusual. Four of the five of us, as it turned out, were from Ohio. Nancy grew up in Troy, Ohio, very close to here. Tom Henricks was from Toledo, and Mary Ellen Weber and I were both from Cleveland. This guy over here, he was not from Ohio. <laughs> That's a problem, right? To make matters worse, he was from Amityville, New York. Have you heard of the Amityville horror? He was from Amityville, so you know, we had an idea. Um, we would write to the governor of Ohio to see if we could make him an honorary Ohioan. <laughs> and I want to show you, this is our crew picture. <laughs> and you guys are all from Ohio, so you probably are smarter than the most audiences. Can you pick out the New Yorker here? <laughs> yeah, that's Kevin there. So we had the idea to write to the governor, and I wrote a letter to Governor Voinovich at the time and said, four of the five of us were from Ohio. Uh, we'd like to make our uh, fifth guy an honorary Ohioan, so we, we could say we have the all Ohio space shuttle mission. And the person on the other end, end of the phone said, who are you? And I said, I'm Don Thomas. I'm an astronaut. I'm on this crew. We're trying to uh, you know, have a proclamation made to make this guy an honorary Ohioan. And they paused and they said, and what do you want? And I, and I repeated this for three or four times and they transferred me to different departments. But finally, we got the right person and they said, yeah, we can do that. So Governor Voinovich I issued a proclamation making Kevin an honorary Ohioan. And this is the official proclamation. This was done at, back in May, uh, May 4th, uh, 1995. And here you see Governor Voinovich hereby officially recognizes Kevin Kriegel, NASA astronaut, as an honorary Ohioan. And we presented this to Kevin, and he was all excited about it, until he read some of the fine print down here. And it says here, thus extending to him all the rights and privileges held dear by the citizens of our state. And Kevin said, do I have to pay taxes in Ohio now? <laughs> and they, we assured him, no, you don't have to do that. And so he was happy to be an honorary Ohioan and we took, let him take his helmet off. <laughs> and so we, we came up with the all Ohio space shuttle mission. And each crew gets to design their patch for the flight. And this was our design. I don't know if you guys uh, can pick out the unusual, unique shape of the outer edges of the patch. This makes it a, maybe a little more obvious, <laughs> right? This was our initial design. We wanted to honor the state of Ohio. Uh, so this was our initial design. Our commander said, this is a little too uh, blatant. And uh, so we went with this design. It's a little more subtle here. And we didn't tell NASA about the shape of the patch and the meaning until they approved the patch design, because we wouldn't want to insult the other 49 states here in the country who are paying for the space shuttle program. So we got the patch designed you know, to honor the state of Ohio. And we were all proud, even Kevin, he was proud to be an honorary Ohioan. So we had the All Ohio Shuttle crew, and our mission was to deploy a big uh, communication satellite. It's called the Tracking and Data Relay Satellite. And we use these satellites to communicate from the space shuttle back to mission control, to, from the space station. And, and a lot of the scientific satellites use these uh, communication satellites to relay their data. Every image of the Hubble Space Telescope, if you've ever seen any of the incredible pictures of the planets and galaxies and nebula, all those images get relayed through the series of satellites. So they're really important. They're kind of in the background. You don't see or hear about them a lot, but they're really important infrastructure for us in space. And our mission was to deploy you know, one of these that you see in the background. This was made outside of Los Angeles uh, by a company, TRW, here. And this is myself and Mary Ellen Weber. We went down to the Kennedy Space Center where they're preparing the satellite for launch here. You get an idea of how big the satellite is. This thing was really huge. And then the satellite gets attached to an upper stage. We deploy the satellite from the space shuttle about 200 miles above the Earth. And these satellites need, need to be in position about 22,000 miles above the Earth. 
So we have a big rocket stage here. There's the engine right there that'll fire. It'll take it from 200 miles out to the 22,000 miles. So that satellite and this upper stage get mated together. So we had the satellite ready. Then we got the space shuttle ready. This is Space Shuttle Discovery. They process them in, in giant hangars called the Orbiter Processing Facility. Once they got it ready for flight, they back it out, take it over to the vehicle assembly building. They got huge cranes that come in, grab a hold of it here at the nose, and then just lift this thing way up in the air. It's got to go over a couple of braces up here in the ceiling. Then they lower it back down, and they attach it to our big fuel tank and our two solid rocket boosters there. Once they have all that attached and ready, typically about a month, two months or so before launch, they roll all those, uh, the, the shuttle stack out to the launch pad. And here you see our vehicle assembly building. That's where they stacked it up. And this crawler transporter comes down here, and it's bringing it right up to the launch pad there. Once they get it to the launch pad, they lower it down on some launch pedestals there. And uh, the next step is to roll this. This is called the rotating service structure. And this forms a, it has a couple of purposes. One thing it does, it rolls over the front of the shuttle and it'll protect the shuttle from, from the weather. If there's hail, if there's heavy rain, it kind of covers the shuttle por portion right here and protects the shuttle. It's also got a lot of work platforms so that the different engineers and technicians can access all parts of the shuttle as we get it ready for launch. One last thing we needed to do was to load up our satellite. That hasn't been put inside the shuttle yet. So here is our satellite. There's our upper stage. They put it in this big canister on this truck. They drive it out to the launch pad, and it gets loaded into our payload bay of the shuttle right there. Once it's all loaded in there, they close the payload bay doors, and then they roll that rotating service structure over the front of the shuttle. And you can see, you can't even see where the space shuttle is here anymore. It's pretty well protected. All you can see near the top here is our big fuel tank and the tips of our solid rocket boosters there. That's, everything else is protected here from the space shuttle. So we had everything in place, and one week before launch, just one week, a single woodpecker attacked that big orange tank of our space shuttle. And the outside of that tank, the big orange tank, is covered with the spray-on foam insulation. It's like what you may put up in the attic. It comes out of a can, polyurethane foam. And the reason for this foam is our fuel in that external tank is really cold. It's about minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And in the humidity of Florida, you know, with, with those cold temperatures, moisture, the humidity will condense out, turn into water, just like you have liquid on the uh, you know, outside of your iced tea or lemonade in the summertime. And that liquid there will turn to ice. And we don't want to launch the shuttle carrying extra liquid, extra ice on there. That ice could break off and damage parts of the shuttle. So we cover the entire outside, all that orange that you see in the big fuel tank is this foam insulation. And it's pretty tough stuff. You know, you can hit it pretty hard. But this one woodpecker decided he was going to try to make a nest in this tank. If we could show that video here, I want to stop the PowerPoint, just show you this a little bit. And we were just about to go into quarantine. You know, one week before the mission, they take us from our families. They put us in a special dormitory. And that morning, I, I was in a trainer practicing the satellite deployment and just got out of the trainer. And one of the trainers said, hey, uh, it sounds like your, wood, uh, your mission's going to be de uh, de delayed because a woodpecker attacked your shuttle. And I laughed. You know, I said, yeah, that's really funny. And they said, no, we're serious. And I said, you've got to be kidding. You know, to have a woodpecker take down the space shuttle there. Just a we'll get this up, and, and we can't shoot it, right? Okay. Come on. You're just there. Okay. So you see him pecking away over here. You'll see some of the foam falling down. <laughs> and a couple things impressed me about this. One was it was done by a single woodpecker. One woodpecker made 205 holes in the tank. Most of them were about an inch or two across. One of them was about uh, four inches across. And that tank, it's, it's a metal aluminum tank, like a giant soda can covered with this soft foam. So the woodpecker is just poking away in the foam, finally gets down to the aluminum, hits that with his beak a few times, and he says, that's too hard, and he moves over here. 
<laughs> and he makes another hole until he hits the aluminum. And then he says, OK, I'm going to try it over here. And he ended up making 205 holes. And I was really impressed that one single woodpecker had that much energy and determination to make the holes there. Something else that I was really impressed with, NASA's got hundreds of hours of video of this. And I always wondered, like, why didn't they stop this after, say, 50 holes? Why not? Or, or maybe 100. Somebody said, OK, time out. I see this woodpecker. But they didn't. This took place over, it was a Memorial Day weekend. Uh, so maybe they were kind of on, on light duty there. But the, you know, one woodpecker made all these holes in there. So we can end that. They couldn't stun them because, again, it's a wildlife refuge. Well, we'll, we'll talk about how we get rid of woodpeckers here. <laughs> OK, we'll go back to PowerPoint here. OK, so these are some of the holes that the woodpecker made. And again, one woodpecker, 205 holes. <laughs> the, the press got a hold of this, and they made a lot of fun of NASA. These are just some of the headlines I clipped out of the newspapers. You know, plan has holes. Pesky woodpeckers rule the roost at NASA. Wings clipped by woodpeckers. You know, so Na everybody was making fun of NASA. David Letterman had jokes about uh, NASA and the woodpeckers. So NASA had to come up with, uh, you know, problem, you know, ways to fix the, all this damage. The first thing they did, we realized we're not going to launch on time. We're probably going to be delayed. But we didn't know if it would be a few days. They didn't know the full extent of the problem. So they brought these giant cranes in, and they put the workers in there, and they mapped out the entire external tank. They went and inspected all parts of it to see how bad the damage was. And they built the scaffolding, again, just to get up there. They wanted to see, measure how, how big the holes were, how many there were, see if they could repair them right on the launch pad. If they could repair them right there, then we could probably launch maybe a week later or so. But finally, after going through all this, they decided, there's too many holes. They're, they're, it's really dangerous to send workers that high up. So they decided, OK, we're going to roll the shuttle back to our vehicle assembly building. There we have a lot more platforms. We can safely and properly patch all the holes. So here's one of the workers. And all you do is take some of the spray on foam. You uh, put it in the hole there. You have a little popsicle stick like you see there. You smooth it out. And then you have to wait about five or six hours until it hardens. They would take a little bit of sandpaper and just smooth it over so it's, it's fairly smooth there, and then move on to the next hole. And whenever we do anything at NASA, we have a worker doing it, and we've got an inspector making sure it's done properly. And that's how we get things done correctly, make sure that everything's done properly the first time. So we fixed all the holes. We moved the shuttle back out to the launch pad. And I, I actually got to go down there for this rollout. And it was pretty amazing to see this big space shuttle rolling out. It, you know, the space shuttle in space travels at about 17,500 miles an hour. And to get it out to the launch pad, this crawler that takes it out there goes about one mile an hour. And it's really such a contrast in, you know, in speed differences here. But they rolled it back out to the launch pad. And this is just some of the holes. It looks like somebody took a shotgun, right, and peppered this. But these are the patches from all those holes from the woodpecker. There's Kevin. We went down there for the rollout, and we took a couple plastic woodpeckers, and, and the workers got a big kick out of this. But NASA still had this big problem, OK? We fixed the holes. We patched them all up. But their problem was, well, how do we prevent woodpeckers from doing this again? It's really bad that it happened one time, and the press made a lot of fun of us. But to have it happen a second time, or a third time, or fourth time, th that would be inexcusable. So NASA had to figure out, how do we keep the woodpeckers away? Fortunately, people from across the country and around the world had great solutions for NASA. And they wrote to NASA with all these ideas. Here's one of them. This thing is called a predator eye balloon, like I have here. And no matter where you're sitting in the auditorium, you probably see two or three scary looking eyes looking at you. And these are the eyes of a predator for a woodpecker. They look like hawk eyes or eagle eyes, owl eyes. And woodpeckers are scared of hawks, eagles, and owls. So the idea is you put this around the launch pad, a woodpecker comes flying by, he sees these huge eyes, and he says, I'm not going anywhere near that giant owl or hawk there and stay away from the, wood, uh, from the space shuttle. It's got these little uh, mylar strips blowing in the wind. That was also to scare away the woodpeckers, like you might put something up to scare away crows. So NASA had these all over the uh, launch pad. 
They had other ideas. Somebody said, you should just point, paint that orange tank blue, because woodpeckers don't like the color blue. It's like, I don't know if that's true or not. But that would add about 400 pounds of weight to the shuttle, so they rejected that idea. Somebody else had the idea, suggestion, all you have to do is spray that big orange tank with skunk cabbage juice. And I have to admit, I grew up in Cleveland, I don't know what skunk cabbage juice smells like, but I got a pretty good mental picture of it. And I, I don't think it would, uh, it may repel the woodpeckers, but it definitely would repel the astronauts and the workers at the launch pad. Another idea they had, well, let me show you a few other pictures here. Uh, this I thought was hilarious when I went out there to the launch pad. At the very big top of that big fuel tank, they put one of those balloons. And I thought, you know, some woodpecker is going to be flying by and see that and get scared away. You know, not likely. Here's another one that looks more like an owl, right? You can see the beak here. And these are called terror eyes or predator eye balloons. And they put them all over the launch pad there. They also had workers here with air horns. And they were just standing there at the ready. If they saw a woodpecker, ah, they would just blast it and scare the woodpeckers away. Remember, we can scare them, but we can't harm them in any way. They also had people with water cannons positioned, you know? And if they saw a woodpecker, they could shoot some water at them and scare them away. They also set up these owls, like I have here. This is just a plastic owl that you can get at the hardware store, you know, Home Depot. And they put these all over the launch pad, too, because woodpeckers are afraid of owls. So we had everything taken care of then. And I showed you our crew patch here. And we were known as the All Ohio Shuttle Mission, right? Well, after this, we became known as the, the woodpecker flight. <laughs> and I don't know what you guys are laughing at. I didn't think this was very funny, especially since they covered up my name over here <laughs> in the process. But we also, after this moment, we became more known as the woodpecker flight than the All Ohio crew. OK, I want to show you a couple of cartoons here. This is a nice one. It says, we made a slight de design change. It scares the woodpeckers away, just putting a little beak on the and here's another one, something called a woodpecker put holes in it and we can't take off. So there was a lot of jokes, the woodpecker jokes about this time back in 1995. This was down at the Kennedy Space Center. This is a telephone pole there and somebody put up this sign and it just says official woodpecker external tank training post. Everything we do at NASA is, is all focused on training. So they put this sign and this was an official place that woodpeckers could go to safely practice making holes. <laughs> well, we got everything fixed. We got the satellites ready. The space shuttle was ready. We were keeping all the woodpeckers away. So it was finally time for us to launch. The astronauts fly down to Florida for the launch about three days before liftoff. We fly in on T-38 jets. And if the weather's good, we can do a little flyby of the launch pad there. And from about 1,000 feet, we come in and just circle. We'll do a little circle around the launch pad before we go in and land. And it's pretty amazing to look out the window and see your space shuttle down there all ready for liftoff. Then on launch morning, we get in our launch suits and we head out to what's called an astro van. This is Tom Henricks, our commander. And I don't know if you can pick that up, but he's holding a lucky Buckeye. We took a number of Buckeyes. We all carried a couple in our pockets that day just for good luck. And we take this bus out to the launch pad. This is a kind of a blurry picture. I had a little camera with me in my pocket. And it's pretty amazing, you know, you're, you're driving out to the launch pad, it's maybe a 15 minute drive, maybe 10 miles, something like that. And you finally turn one corner, and then straight out the window, there you see your launch, your space shuttle on the launch pad, ready to go. And it really gets the butterflies going. It's like, wow, there it is. You can see liquid oxygen, you know, condensing um, the vapor from it near the tail of the shuttle here. It's just, it's ready to go. It's really an amazing moment. We got out to the launch pad a few minutes early. They weren't ready for us to take the elevator up. So we had like five or 10 minutes just to walk around down at the base of the shuttle. Usually you get off that little van, they send you right back up, you know, up on the elevator to get inside the shuttle. But we had time to just stand back and take a look at the shuttle up close. Here you see Tom Hendricks, our commander. He's just looking up. Uh, the ma three main engines are right up in there and you see the condensation from the liquid oxygen they're forming. So it was pretty cool. There I am in my launch suit. We've taken the elevator up. I'm just waiting when it's my turn to get strapped into my seat. They'll call my name. I'll turn this corner, walk down an access arm, and at the end of it there, you see the round hatch for the shuttle. 
I've got uh, these two guys here. Before I climb on board, they'll help me put on a parachute. We'll get the helmet on, gloves on. Once we're all set, I'll get on my hands and knees and we crawl inside and they strap us into our seat. We've got shoulder harnesses and seat belts. They strap us in nice and tight because there's a lot of shaking and vibration during liftoff and you don't want to bounce out of your seat. Once they, uh, we're all strapped in, they close and seal this hatch and then everybody moves away from us three and a half miles. And when you realize why they just moved away from you three and a half miles, it's another good moment to get butterflies in your stomach. They're getting out of the blast zone. If anything bad should happen, if you're three and a half miles away, you're probably okay. And it's quiet inside up until six seconds before liftoff. That's when the three engines here at the tail of the shuttle start coming to full power. We're still physically bolted down to the launch pad at that point. And once the computers say those three engines look good, then we light our two side rockets called solid rocket boosters and immediately we take off. And we're laying on our backs in our seat, a lot of shaking and vibration. And at that moment of liftoff, it feels like somebody has their hand right in the middle of your back, just pushing you up into the sky. And that's what the shuttle's doing, literally pushing us, throwing us up in the air there. This picture is probably taken two, three seconds after liftoff. We're going about 100 miles an hour already. So we don't ease off the launch pad. It is literally boom, and you accelerate faster and faster every second. This is a picture of my wife and my son. And you can see my wife's eyes. They're focused right on the space shuttle. People frequently ask me, you know, is your son impressed that you're an astronaut? I think this picture pretty much covers it. <laughs> I'm launching here, and he's looking at some bug down on the ground here. My son is now a freshman in college, you know, um, but, you know, he's not too impressed that I'm an astronaut anyway. Uh, I think it, I'm just dad for him. And about a minute into the flight, this happened. This doesn't look very good, does it? You know, we fly in the, this is in July in, down in Florida. There's a lot of humidity in the air. And as we go through maximum pressure, aerodynamic pressure called max Q, the moisture will get condensed out. Sometimes you'll see this on uh, airplane on the wings. You know, you'll see little uh, vapor trails coming off from that. So this just happens for about a second. The moisture gets condensed out from that pressure and then it quickly evaporates. But for people on the ground, like your family and friends watching, it's like, wow, what, what, what is that? But as soon as they see it, it's, it's over again. And it's a pretty normal uh, phenomenon in launching in July down there. Well, it only takes eight and a half minutes to get to space. And eight and a half minutes later, the engine shut down, gets perfectly quiet. Then there's a big kaboom. We fire some explosive bolts, and the space shuttle would separate from that big fuel tank. And this thing would just fall back in the atmosphere and burn up like a shooting star. It's the only part of the shuttle we didn't reuse ever. Just use it one time to get up there and then it would separate. And our first task when we get to space is to unstrap out of our seats, grab a couple cameras, and we take pictures of the tanks on every mission just to see how they perform, to make sure there's no problems, to make sure this big uh, you know, foam isn't coming off in any bad places. And they were particularly interested in some of these little patches from the woodpecker holes. They wanted to make sure that they had survived in case this ever happens again. And everything looked good to us here. So we got right to work deploying our satellite. Normally, the first day or two of a space shuttle mission, it's very quiet and relaxed. We're kind of unpacking, you know, getting out of our space suits, setting up equipment there. And it's pretty relaxed schedule. On these missions, when we deploy satellites like this one, we deploy the satellite six hours after launch. So we get up there, get out of our suits, and almost immediately we start checking out the satellite, make sure it looks good before we finally deploy it. So it's a very, very busy, hectic first day. So we check it out, and then we finally tilt it up to like a 60 degree angle there. And uh, once everything looks good, all we do is hit a button. And that was my main job on the mission was to deploy the satellite. So I tell my friends and family, I, I push the button that said deploy, and then this thing just pops out of the, the payload bay there. And people say, that's all you do? I could push a button, but it's a very complicated button, OK? <laughs> so we push that button, and then the satellite just starts floating out of the payload bay. Uh, there's our rocket engine that's going to send it out to the 22,000 miles. And we deployed it. This, this is maybe taken uh, five minutes after we deployed it. And then we have to uh, move the shuttle. We get out of the way, because this rocket engine is going to fire in about 10 minutes. And we don't want the shuttle anywhere near there in case uh, this thing should blow up. We don't want shrapnel from that hitting the shuttle. So as soon as we deploy this thing, it moves away from us a little bit. We fire some engines on the shuttle to separate our distance there. So that, that's about the last we ever saw of the satellite. 
The engines are two-stage rocket engine here, worked perfectly. And about 24 hours later, it was out safely at its orbit at 22,000 miles. And that's what it looks like when it's fully deployed. It's really a huge satellite, about 60 feet across. It's got some solar panels here for generating electricity. Big uh, parabolic dishes here look like giant umbrellas for communicating, sending signals back and forth. And again, we use these for the Hubble Space Telescope. A lot of